Hi everyone, I have a very exciting interview for you today. It is with the Veterans Community Response. They are a nonprofit based in the US and they help veterans reintegrate back into society and be welcomed, work through their PTSD. And this is all done in the tradition of Native American ceremony and ritual for the returning warriors. And so you might be wondering, well, what does this have to do with reform? There's got to be more to reform than just, you know, something in a dusty textbook. And sure, we can talk about what did it been to me as a 691 years ago, but like, I get it. He's going to still be around tomorrow. There's got to be more. And I think that that more is what does reform have the capacity to do today? My sort of template for reform, which is sort of look at everything and connect the dots and see where bridges are made, see where patterns repeat. I'm so excited to bring these guys to you. They were so much fun. Um, I guess that's it. It's over to what they have to say. Thank you. When our warriors used to come back from battle, they would have sweat ceremonies for them to cleanse themselves off of everything that happened to them while they're in battle. A lot of them brought back their brothers carried across the back of their horse. They carried their dead warrior friends, their brothers and relatives with them. So they had all that sorrow and grief that they carried back many miles. Then they would come back into camp. And the healers, they would put them in this lodge for about four days and fast for a number of days. Then they would bring them back in, start them on a spiritual journey, and then they would come back out into the community. That's what has been left out for a lot of our veterans. A lot of them weren't welcome. There is a spiritual side of healing that's very important. We're not religious. This is a spiritual thing that we practice. It's healed for thousands of years, and it works. And I came across the article that was featuring Darren's story, and of course all of your stories, and I just found it. It just hit home with me. Darren and I had a really long talk last time, and we just sort of like dug into really what, what drives us, and I think essentially it comes down to the... I guess you could call it the human experience. What does it mean to be human? Why, you know, what do you, why are we dealing with these issues? And more importantly, when we're dealing with these issues, what does it mean when someone's sort of like left out of, of the end of the um, conveyor belt process? So they've, you know, they've done everything they've needed to do in, in your guys' cases. You've gone off to war, you've gotten trained, then you come back and it's like, oh, story is over. But I think there's a whole other story there. And, and it really resonated with me because what happens to people when they don't feel like they belong? And, and, you know, how does that make someone feel? And then how do you kind of fix that? What drew me to the story, it, the story was featured, I believe, in the New York Times, was this idea of ritual and ceremony. And what I find lacking as, as someone in my own journey with, with Muslim reform and looking at, you know, how do you take something that's 1,400 years old and bring it into the modern world? And then what I found out is that really, the modern world, so to speak, isn't really cutting it for a lot of people right now. Um, there is religion and spirituality. Um, religion is being told what to do. Uh, matter of the religion is being told what to do, whether it's right or wrong. Spirituality is doing what's right, no matter what you're told. And it kind of it kind of builds from there. Um, off the little side note here, uh, we weren't really allowed to do these sweat lodges and stuff in public until 1978, which is not that far away. Um, we had our sun dances and we've had sweat lodges, but we had to do it in secret because they were banned by the government. You, I don't know, maybe, I think they were scared. <laughs> but the spirituality part of it is making that connection with the creator. And there are many different ways to do it. And recognizing that there is one, um, we've had even some atheists that have started a belief system now with the Creator. Um, they wanted to just experience the sweat lunch to come inside. And over time, things have happened. They felt something. They didn't quite know what it was. They didn't really want to admit what it was. They knew what it was, but they didn't want to admit it. So that's uh, kind of what spirituality is just uh, 
an overall belief. And when we go into the lodges, I don't care if you pray to a rock or you pray to Buddha, whoever it is. We go in there and we communicate and we talk and uh, it gets real, real hot and we sing and, and we pray and, uh, you know, we try to form spirituality is within all of us. We just have to have ways for it to come out of us. And a lot of people have repressed that because they don't quite know what it is or how to do it. But... So spirituality is just something that's in every living thing. I mean, it's uh, as we believe, it's in the trees, the grass, all all things that are that are alive. Mike, you're you're a combat vet, right? Yes. Let me ask you a question. Your training is is I mean, it's rooted in, in military theory and in, in, in being very kinetic and very hands on, very tactical. How and I and I take it you've done you've done the ceremonies as well you've partaken in it. How is that transition going from something that is so clinical, that is so the black and white, and then immersing as a return to something that is so spiritual and rooted in in the abstract? And do you did you struggle with that? Do you find other people struggle with that? Um, well, I have definitely seen other people struggle with it. Um, for me, it was like a duck in water. I, I was immersed with this, the, the energy and just the overwhelming, the sensations of being in the sweat lodge and being with the other veterans and, and just being able to break down a lot of the barriers that I had on myself. Um, it opened me up to really just looking at the world in a different perspective. Uh, I, I, tell every veteran that I come across that it is a wonderful experience for them to get involved with the sweat lodge. Not because of necessarily the spiritual aspect, but the overall cleansing and the healing aspect of it. Because you know, the toxins that are removed from your body and then just the sense of being welcome and being able to kind of grasp that piece of us that we're lost when we're mm -hmm. over overseas, you know, in war environment. So uh, it's it's changed everything in my world. So it's, I'm, I'm definitely a, a huge believer in it. The average person will use the word soldier, whereas you will say the word warrior. And so mm -hmm. do you find there's, there's something to be said about language and, and what is the difference between essentially a soldier and a warrior? It would be a very fine line between, I, Basically, the only difference I, I see in them is, is the words. One is, you know, you're called a soldier or you're a warrior, but all soldiers are warriors. Because in, in the old days, as we were called warriors and we would go out to um, the war parties and have battle with other nations, other tribes. Um, and when it's a matter of I think that's why we do use combat veterans because you had to have been in, even in the old days, in combat. You had to have warrior status. And right now, as, as having warrior status, and in, in, even in today's times on most nations, the veterans are highly honored. Um, as we go to powwows, they have the veterans carrying the flags and... Uh, they have what is also called a Sundance, and the veterans will tell their stories about what happened in combat. And also when, when they come back from combat, when they come back to the United States, in our nation, I tell you, we've, and it was, this is done long ago, when you came back from war, your war party, you didn't go right to your family. We had this huge lodge uh, teepee set aside where the warriors would go in there for four days. They would stay in there for four days, and they would some of them would heal. They'd have tend to their wounds. They would nourish, bring them back, and they would um, tell their stories and and reintegrate and heal and, and come back to the trauma that they just went through 
we had to, they didn't want them to bring it to their families. So they would, I guess, the, the elders would talk to them and they would counsel them. And, uh, you know, the tears were shed. And, and the stories of what happened and would be told. And before they went back out, and a lot of times, and again, they would go into a sweat lodge to get cleansed, to get purified. We would believe that when you go off to war, we always, we leave a piece of us wherever we were at. Part of our soul, part of our spirit is left there. So when we go into this lodge, we go out and we call it back. So you can begin to heal as a whole person without leaving a little piece of you out of it. And once you get that done, that's when the healing really starts to happen. I have a, a really dear friend who's a combat vet. And there's, there's pieces. I mean, there's so much that he's been through that there's no way I would ever know or could ever understand it. But there's pieces of a story that come through when we speak. And one of the things he said recently, and, it, and, it, and I had no way of really helping or even having a conversation with him about it because what can I possibly do? Whatever I said would make it worse. The thing he said was that when you've been away and you come back, home feels really alien. Like America is very alien to him. It doesn't feel like his home. His home is the the combat environment, the fields, the battlefield, and which is so tragic to me because you're never going to get that. I mean, even my, migrants in the migrant crisis have a piece of home, a memory of a home, something static, something that would always be there. Even if they lost it, it's there in a memory. But a battlefield is always changing. It's constant chaos. And if that's your home, what are you coming home to? There is no home. And he said he felt really alienated in a way. He didn't use that word, but he felt really alienated. And he said that, you know, America, he can't recognize his brothers here because he, what he sees in America is a land of um, what he called it marshmallow people and so there's no <laughs> yeah <laughs> so how do you how do you how, how do you live like that I just don't even understand how you could live like how do you deal with that on a day in day basis because that's how do you carry that story back how do you share that story I feel like there was another story recently in the news where um, it was a fellow who, a veteran who was killed on the Appalachian Trail, and before he went hiking as a way of dealing with the PTSD, there was, there was sort of the idea that he would just stay home all the time and lock himself home and only come out to get food or come out, you know, when he needed to. And so when you've got that, that veteran story and you've got the story of this friend of mine who, who feels like this is not his home anymore, how can the sweat lodge, how can the brotherhood, how can the community help and how can it reach these people? Okay, well, I'll talk on a little bit then I want to um, let Mike say some things on that. The, one, everybody that's in this lodge is a veteran, you know, and then we have others that come in, but the odds to say everybody, the majority of the people that are in there are veterans. It's pitch black in there. You can't to your hand if you touch it to your nose and as we call the rocks when we bring in the grandfathers as they heat up and they start speaking to us we we do four rounds and we pray for like the children the women all living things and the warriors <clears throat> and as we're doing that it just the grandfathers it might be hard to even believe or explain. It just draws it out of you. It draws all that, that trauma and, and, and everything that you had. And that's not, it's not an immediate cure, but you're, you're safe in there. Um, it help you, you know, you can laugh, you can scream, you can cry. You can do whatever you want. Nobody is going to make fun of you in there. Everything, you're, you're respected in there. And that's the one step in healing and, and coming back to the world coming back into the into this life because the sweat lodge it, it's it resembles it's like the womb of mother earth it's you know there's it's hot in there and it's it's damp and it's dark and there's one way in and one way out and you come back out it's just kind of like a, a reborn experience you come out here you feel much better um and there's been people who 
well, Mike Carroll here, he was a horrible man before. You know, I mean, he'll tell you himself. He, you didn't want to know him. But being around that and him going through these things and, and, and working, and he takes care of the rocks for me now, and he helps build it and everything. And so I'll kind of let him talk about what it was like. Um, best way I can put it is this is kind of words from another dear friend of mine. It's it's like the 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 butterfly metaphor, you know, because you mentioned what's the difference between a soldier and a warrior. Well, the soldier is a caterpillar, and the soldier is moving throughout his military service, leading up to the combat zone, and that's where you know they usually create their cocoon you know, and everything else, and, and the word is that thriving butterfly that is being made inside that cocoon. It's through suffering and breaking down and being crushed and being remade is where the warrior is, because when you go over there, you were changed completely. There's a... There's no sense that you could possibly be that same person that you once were, but through the process of going into the sweat lodges and participating and being a part of the support system that we build in with these programs, then we can come forth and, and bloom, you know, and we can really see that the thriving nature of working together in a community and you know and it's like that that's basically you know that's the best way I I've ever heard it said is because the soldier is the caterpillar uh -huh. and the warrior is in the cocoon and the thriving part is when they come forth after the suffering and agony and pain to be able to be the butterfly that they want to be but that has to be on their own journey you know because the BCR, of course, with the sweat lodges, is something to help hold them for the cocoon, uh -huh. but it's not a forceful pull. So when they're able to come forth from the, the sweat lodge and build that support group with other veterans in their community, then that's when the thriving really starts to begin. It's and uh, you probably heard of the bowl in in a, a China store, yeah. you know, with the the bowl thrashing around. Mm -hmm. uh, that's how a lot of warriors feel in their mind mm -hmm. when they're around people in our society nowadays. Because a lot of the times it seems like everyone is complaining or whining about things that they need or should have. And for us warriors, we fought and sacrificed everything so that they can actually live the pampered lives that they have. And we hope and, you know, it... it infuriates a lot of us because going to the store alone Walmart especially <laughs> going to a store alone for a veteran that has been in combat is just it's horrible what's it like you, you because you're surrounded by the people that you sacrifice your self and your body and your soul and your spirit for okay. and you hear nothing but complaining and just always whining about what they should have and if they don't have it, then they'll throw a tantrum. And it's just, it's not the way that we perceive our society being when we come home. We, per we perceive that we would hope that when we come home, we would come home to grateful people uh -huh. that are appreciative of our service and what we have done for them. And a lot of us come home and that's not the case and ostracized uh -huh. or alienated is a lot of the terms that come for the warriors that do come home. So it's, that's about as much as I can get with that well, one. It, it, it seems to me like we have an entire, I don't want to say class, but an entire sort of group of people who, who've come back and they're still in sort of in limbo or they're still in the cocoon or still in stasis and they haven't transitioned to the next step. At the same time, it's exactly like you mentioned, you, you've got this sort of culture of, of, and that is something I'm unfortunately very familiar with because that is all the people that I'm trying to impact do is, what's the phrase, can I say it, bitch and moan about life and all the problems that they have and and there's no sort of um, self-actualization or self-initiative. And we've got, 
and I think that the two of us can really relate to that. We've got this entire class of um, social justice warriors, right? We've got people in politics who call themselves warriors. What would be, specifically Mike, and of course Roger and Darren as well, but what would be your message to people who like to call themselves social justice warriors and who like to call themselves political warriors? But we, you at least, I can't say I because I've never been to war, but what would be your message to those people who like to self-identify as a warrior in, in, in that capacity? Well, first I'd tell them to stop lying to themselves because they're putting on a facade and especially if they're going to be a leader and someone is going to, you know, bring the people to what mission that they're trying to establish, um, they can't be a proper leader if they're being having a false front or putting titles on themselves even though they have not actually experienced or done it themselves. It just... It, we all know in the working class, you cannot get to a position unless you have actually worked to that mm -hmm. to that spot. And for political warriors to say that they are that, that I kind of chuckle because that just uh, that's kind of a slap in the face. Mm -hmm. um, because the word warrior to me means so much more than just the word. It's the the being the the way, the, the poise and the stoic nature of it, of knowing that you have survived when many have died before you and have died next to you and will die in the future. And they have that, they have that title because they've earned it. Mm -hmm. And for people that have not earned it, are labeling themselves as warriors, that, that is wrong in my book in so many different levels. It should not be that way. <laughs> is there a space for warriors in what America is right now? Oh, um, warriors, warriors and soldiers, again, it's, I see a warrior as someone that has experienced combat, has been in an actual war. Um, we have all these political people, some of them even wear camouflage and make, call themselves officers that are having, have no training at all of any kind and they want to start kind of a movement of some kind. They want to, we've got the, the skinheads and all these other people like that, that who are saying that they're, maybe that's, those are the soldiers. I don't know, but they're not warriors. Warriors are something, is something that a title that you carry proudly. And you can say, yes, I am a true warrior. Yes, I have been to war. That war, war and warrior, they, they go together. If one of those elements is missing, and that is you haven't been in a combat. You haven't been in a war. I understand that there's a lot of things going on throughout this world that is wars that are going on who are people that are innocent, especially the children. Um, and, and even in that aspect, it's, you could almost call them warriors because even though they're not part of the thing, they're there, they're fighting for their lives and they have to do whatever it takes. And they were belittling here in America of what that status is as a veteran and a warrior, mostly a warrior. Like I consider Darren a warrior, even he's not a veteran. He is a warrior. He's a, a, a spiritual warrior, for one. And what he does to help the veterans, that even lifts him up even more, to, to me, to people that recognize what's, what is a warrior, what's going on, and what can we do to help. And warriors help each other. And that's kind of how I see it. If Darren's never been to combat, but he's a spiritual warrior, would you say that right now, globally, or within the states, within at least certain issues, we're in a sort of spiritual war? How would you how would you respond to that? That's really what it is, spiritual war. And as as we can see things, once you get a hold of your spiritual senses and your spiritual mind, we all have it, whether we denounce it or not. It's there. We're born with it. 
And once you come to those senses and you find out what your maybe kind of what your purpose is, what you want, what can you do to make help make things better? That's that's a warrior mentality, and you're not only for your family, but you're doing it for yourself, your family, your friends, and others, so that it could be better. And I'll turn it over to Darren. <laughs> uh, I, yeah, I, I do believe that there is a there is a, a spiritual war going on right now. That it's it's deeper than just the combat of man. I do believe that's true. Um, I believe that it's the responsibility, if chosen, of every human to fight uh, for a better world in whatever way they can. Now, not everybody can go off to combat or does end up in that lifespan. I didn't. Um, so many others don't or can't. So many others uh, don't have that possibility. But to me, it's it's very simply, it's what you do in the circle you're in. And everybody has the opportunities to leave positive impact, negative impact, or little impact. And uh, I think that 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 is fighting that battle, whatever. I mean, I don't really like to use those terms mm-hmm. because it is, I, I haven't, I haven't been in that situation that uh, that Mike talks about. Um, he does have a different set of experiences than I do. I've never had anybody shooting their gun at me. Um, it's 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 definitely a, it's a different battle, but it is some. It, there is something going on for this world right now. There's something very critical, um, I, and I do believe it's apparent that either we. Uh, make a massive shift very quickly or uh the human race right now looks it's it's not looking good <laughs> it is for us but this is what we got to do man we got to keep trying yeah. mike you mentioned uh the bull in a china shop analogy and and i feel <clears throat> like that is so true for so many people right now so one of the areas that i work in is preventing violent extremism which looks at why people become radicalized or why they fall for certain ideologies. And I think one of the reasons is to touch to, Roger, what you said is is the lack of spirituality, the lack of grounding in anything greater than the sort of um, obsession with the individual uh, self or the obsession with immediate needs or material needs. And there's no sort of brotherhood that's larger than ourselves. Would you say that this model of, of ritual and ceremony for for returning veterans, combat veterans, would be something that could be applied to youth towards the, say, 14 to 18 plus demographic where, uh, you know, there is an issue of, you know, what does it mean to be a man? What does it mean to be part of a community? What does it mean to be uh, initiated towards being an elder? You know, what what's the foundation for getting to that? Would you say that this is maybe a model for that? Well, it's, yeah, I think... We start off saying this is basically a lot of these hate group, neo Nazi type things, I mean, and, and gangs, people, especially our youth, just want to belong to something. They want to be a part of something and they see this and they're easily influenced by it. <clears throat> but in long ago, and which is now starting to come back, um, we were taught about these things by the elders and and now the the movement of culture and tradition within all the nations is getting strong it's it's growing they're starting to teach the language there um there are schools now where they send their children to where they learn the language the songs the traditions and basically how to be a, a better person that can serve their their tribe in, in their community and not having to go out and get into all this trouble and everything. And as, as we're trained from growing up, I grew up with my grandparents, you know, we are to one is respecting the elders and it doesn't necessarily mean an old person. It's anyone that's older than you has. And if you're acting up and acting bad, um, like, and, and an older person, 
longer when uh, talked to you with this little snicker substance. They had every right to. If you went back and said, Mama, Grandma, that woman or that man hit me with a stick, first <laughs> thing they would say, well, what were you doing? You know, what did you do to deserve that? You must have not been behaving. So the, the respect factor is, is one of the biggest things, I think, in teaching our traditions is where it starts from. That's, I think, that's the grounding post. That's, that's the hitching post. And from there, you just, you learn, as my grandpa said, you learn as much as you want to. And you do what you can. And then that's still kind of how, how I see it. You know, you learn as much as you want to as you're growing older and you're paying attention and you're watching and you're listening. Um, you know, as when we were kids, if elders were talking, you know, we'd sat and listen. Unless they told us, you know, that if there was something that they didn't want us to hear, you know, go outside and play. <laughs> so, but this doesn't concern you. And we didn't have the right to question an elder, you know, it's like, well, you know, what are you talking about? That was, that was a no-no, you know, even in now and today, um, a lot of us of follow tradition will get up and say, you know, I apologize to my elders. I mean, no disrespect for being up here speaking in front of you. And then we'll say what we have to say. It goes around in terms of, uh, you know, the children will follow what they're taught and with a lot of the extremist stuff, you know, whether it's in America, Afghan, Iraq, the children will follow what they know and what they see. And that's why, you know, these people taking advantage of the children, you know, and forcing them to get, well, not necessarily always forcing them because the fact that that's all the kids know. Uh -huh. um, because also because of the fact that everyone in their eyes are the good guys. Uh -huh. You know, whether they be extremists, whether they be American, whether they be Buddhist or whatever it may be extreme, everyone is the good guy in their own eyes. So whenever anything that they know is being attacked or something that in their culture is not being done by the way that they believe it should be, then that's when the, the fear and the anger and the hatred builds. And that right there is the part that the kids latch on to the quickest. Why? Because they latch on to the anger and the fear and the hatred because a child, when they're born, they are pure and they're innocent. And when they see the hatred, the fear, and the anger, then it's so much easier for them to do because it's just a, a natural lashing out kind of emotion. So when they are being raised in whatever culture they are in and put into the position of a man before they are due time, uh. then it just it causes a lot of it just causes a lot of hurt and horrible in the world. And you know, because like I was saying is the fact that, you know, you got your extremists, that they all believe that they're in the right, of course, because of their beliefs and their religions. It's the same for, you know, the Christians or the Mormons or Buddhists. They all feel that way. No one thinks they're the bad guy, basically. Was that? No one thinks they're the bad guy. It's, it's always the other person. What does right. it mean that someone is made to be a man before they're ready? Well, I mean, if you take a 10-year-old boy who hasn't exactly experienced life and has not actually been able to blossom into a young man, you know, when, of course, usually around the age of 16 is when they're more prominent to doing things because they are trying out new things. Mm -hmm. They're experiencing new things. And so when you, some of those ten-year-old boys have to put a gun in their hand, right? Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. so when that is being taken advantage of, then that's wrong, mm -hmm. you know, in any way, any way possible. It doesn't matter what religion or culture it is. If they are used that innocence for uh, for something that is bad mm -hmm. to happen to other people in other communities. 
then that just it shouldn't happen. Mm-hmm. You know, I think, I think Mike's correct. It, it, you know that being a childhood can can happen in a variety of different ways mm-hmm. and does happen in a variety of ways. It can happen um, through sexual abuse. It can happen through enforced early labor. It can happen through uh, being forced into being a child soldier. Um, there's so many factors that you know some children have to be the parent because their their parent is a, a drug addict um, I think these guys have you know they've really what they've said really rings true for me that first the first thing is that good parenting that's super important um, the human being seems to work well with uh, with a couple of parents around it that's that's a great way to raise a child and and then removing those elements that put a person into an early adulthood. Um, and I don't know, you know, there's no magic answer, I don't suppose. I mean, because of what, you know, Mike said, I mean, there, no one thinks they're the bad guy. Mm-hmm. In my mind, one of the, the critical things that we've done wrong is we've started to say, because this path is right for me, it also must be right for you. Uh, and I think that that's a really dangerous philosophy of assuming that because you found a way that works for you that ergo that path has to work for everybody. Oh, if it doesn't work for you, I'm going to fucking kill you. Yeah. And so <laughs> yeah. I, and that seems to me a bit, to be a big problem, regardless of where you lie on the spectrum, uh, on the political or religious spectrum. If you think that you have the only right answer and that all the good guys are in your, on your team and that everyone else who has a different mindset or a different religious belief is wrong uh, to me that's a non-starter and that seems to be where we're at as a definitely as a as a nation it uh, probably as a world at this moment yeah i i think where it uh, there's also this children are look i mean if your daddy is a gangbanger and he's telling you all these things are, you know, you're you're involved of in some in, in in war, and that's all you see. And there's no one else to to help guide you in in these ways. That's what you're gonna do. And if there's even you know, there's good kids that go bad, uh-huh. and you know, and it's again back with Darius. So I think it's the parenting right now is. Um, this this technology that we have it's it's the games uh, the TV the violence everything and you know the kids get home there's no one home mm-hmm. they you know they're they're taking care of themselves they watch pornography or whatever it is whatever they want to do and they get into other things and they want to start trying to find some things maybe you know I'm tired of bored and sitting at home well come and hang out with us by the way here's a gun. And, and it, it is, it's, the key of it is, is, it is the parenting, but the parenting needs, they need to know, they need to be trained, mm-hmm. is what I think. And, and I'm, I'm big on the, the fact of that I think respect needs to be a class in, in high school. Before that. <laughs> Before that. Before that. Yeah, what does that class look cause... like? What is, what does a class on respect look like? Oh boy. You'll have to come to my class. No. <laughs> <laughs> it, it it's always hard to to explain. In order to, I thought about it because somebody said, "Well, would you teach it?" <laughs> and I said, "Well, it might, my ideals might not be everybody else's. Is it would have to be and the way I would do it. It would be taught in the native way. Mm. And for you know, we have to get some elders in um, and." We almost start back with the basics, as you know, even if, if they're teens, this is what you need to do. This is how you need to talk to people. This is how you need to treat people. You don't tell this anybody, you know, especially another, you know, I'll F off. I don't have to listen to you. Or with, with this bullying thing that's going on, you know, no way. My kid ain't like that. <laughs> it's your kid probably caused it. Mm-hmm. You know, my kid's not a bully, so they get these people in. And then they get mad. They go after the teacher and principal or whoever else. They go after. They get mad at the parents of the kid that is being bullied. Saying, well, "Why did you? Why are you accusing kid of being bullied when everybody there knows that he or she is?" Mm-hmm. And it's 
accepting responsibility is, is another big part of that. Accepting responsibility for who you are, what you are, and, and how, what, how you see life. Are you a giver or are you a taker? You know, it's, it almost comes down to that. Are you, are you going to give to help? Or are you going to take and not give a shit? Mm-hmm. And let everybody else not, you know, I don't care, not my problem. I like your shoes. Bam. I got these new Nikes off a guy that I just killed. And, you know, and it's things like that. It said, where I, yeah, where'd you get the shoes? And they're saying, you know, then the more it costs, mm-hmm. the more your status builds. If you're wearing these $300 shoes, Instead of, you know, well, you know, my parents got them for me, who my dad works hard, or I, I earned them myself. I had to get the money to get these. And it, it's the, the factor of, of the respect is just learning these things from the basics that have been forgotten. That it can be taught if you don't know it. Uh-huh. You know? And, and basically, I mean, you always hear, well, I, why did you do that? Because he dissed me. What did he do? He looked at my woman funny, you know, right in front of me. That's not disrespect. You know, that's, that's not a disrespecting factor. You know, to, there, there are so many different ways of, there are more ways to disrespect than there is to respect somebody. And, and to learn that, to learn to try to be humble is some people see it as a weakness, but all warriors are humble. I love that. I think that's beautiful. <laughs> I know that's that's really beautiful. I think because one of the uh, the val- I think it, what you're saying it comes back to the issue of values. You know, what are we valuing? And it, it, I think it ties into what all three of you were talking about, which is we. I think we've forgotten what our values are, which again is what really drew me to to speaking with Darren to begin with is is this return to an older way, a return to older teachings. There was a fellow who uh, who's a scientist who had this fantastic conversation with where he's going into the nitty gritty. I mean, I couldn't even keep up with this guy because he's just, he's so brilliant, but he's going into how the most advanced science right now is actually converging with uh, shamanistic principles and, and shamans and their teachings. And so even the idea that is rock consciousness, you know, how do you, what is the consciousness? And so these really, really old, I would say, quote unquote, primitive principles that have been classified as primitive for so long are now actually teaming up with science and because one can lean on the other. And that's really where we're kind of headed is, is realizing that uh, what we had classified as savage or as primitive is, is really where we need to kind of get back to because we've lost our, our values and our wisdom and, and the same thing goes for uh, Native American teachings. I was telling Darren, I felt like when I was in fourth grade and I learned about Native Americans for the first time, I'm like, where, where, where have these people been my whole life? Like, this is my family right here. Why did I end up all the way over there? And it's just, there was something in it that was so innately beautiful and simple. And a return to that is really, really important. And I think um, what you guys are doing is fantastic. Roger, I'd love to talk to you a little bit more, actually all three of you, because there is an opportunity to bring a curriculum to school districts. And then, so I'm really interested in hearing about, uh, I ask you about respect because I'm oh, genuinely, oh. genuinely <laughs> I just interested. Teach class. You know, we could, yeah, like if there is a workshop on respect for, let's say, fourth graders, what would that look like? Uh, let's talk again about that, because I think we have an opportunity to do something together here. But I will let you go, because I know Mike's been standing for a while. Um, and I'm sure <laughs> you guys could use a break, but if okay, you don't mind, I'll arrange it better. I didn't really realize Mike was going to be here as well, and so I didn't figure out a setup that would work out ahead of time. Actually, Mike is fine. You're the one who's disadvantaged because you're cut off, so we don't we don't get to see your face at all. So there you go. Uh, you know, sorry, am I out of the picture? <laughs> You've been out of the picture. We didn't have the camera. No worries. We will. Well, hopefully we can do this in person at some point because I, I would love to. Oh, last question is very, very important. For veterans out there who, who are listening to this, how can they get in touch with you? What's the process? What will be the next steps? They can uh, look on our website, which is www.vetcomres.org. That's V-E-T-C-O-M-R-E-S dot org. We have a Facebook page, Veterans Community Response. On both of those mediums, there uh, is a phone number that they can call. 
uh, or they can message us or email us. All the all that information is on there. We um, we really would like to encourage uh, all combat veterans, the guys who especially who are um, who are isolating, uh, struggling to remember that they are a valuable asset, a valuable resource, and their nation needs them. Yes, uh, it's really important that that we all, all the communities across the United States start recognizing that this is a tremendous resource that is being allowed to go to waste by not re-engaging our combat vets as they return. We are going to need them. We have been in a very lucky situation where the disasters have tended to happen on a larger scale in other parts of the world. but. Um, Things are happening here. We need to rebuild our communities. We need them stronger. And for that, we need our returning combat vets. We need them engaged. So I would encourage all of them, re-engage in some way in your community. And I encourage every community member out there, find a way to engage these people, to bring them home properly, mm-hmm. and uh, to get them back engaged with the community. Because these are people who are resilient. Uh, they're battle-tested. Um, there's a certain knowledge that I see with combat vets, a certain uh, wisdom that comes mm-hmm. from that experience that I think uh, I'd, I'd love to see more combat vets re-engaging with their community. So they don't need to isolate and struggle there. They're just deployed on a different mission. Their mission now is to get better from what they've been through, They're to come back to to their families, to their communities, wherever it else. That's that's their mission now, because they've learned these skills, and then maybe that's all they have now. There are opportunities to learn other skills. You know, just is uh, as you say, because your healing doesn't mean the pain don't don't exist, but it doesn't have to control your life. And if you need to get in touch with me, um, you're welcome to call me at any time or. You're ever in the area or wherever, or we can go there and we'll build a sweat lodge for you. You're welcome to come in. That's beautiful. Uh, hold that open. You should invitation. experience it. It is a tremendous, yes. tremendously powerful spiritual experience. I would love to. I would actually, you know, when I went into the pathway of reform, I left law school. This is 2002, and I said, let me just, you know, be a vagabond and try all this, di- all these different religious things as I was trying to figure out what's going on in my own faith. And so one of them was um, this this sort of Golden Temple Indian retreat off in the hills of Beverly Hills, like this hole in the wall where it was just complete remoteness for three days. And it was the best experience I've ever had because it, it was so unfamiliar. And that was at the start of my entire journey, I think. Um, I wouldn't have then been ready for something like a sweat lodge, but at this point, yeah, I think absolutely. I, I can really resonate with that. Uh, what, what it's all an open you invitation to you. Whatever, I mean, I might be moody and grumpy because I don't like sweating, but other than that, it will be <laughs> right. fantastic. We didn't seem to handle the sweat lodge they yeah, do. a little better than me. Yeah, yeah really? Do. Okay, <laughs> we'll see about that. <laughs> That's true. Thank you. And Thank then you become, a lot of these guys have become addicts. And I mean that in a good way. They're addicted to the sweat lodge. This so they, is they come back again then. It's not just a over one time. And over and they want to see how much more they can. One guy started out with one round, two, three, mm-hmm. four. Then there's one that we I call the white buffalo round where it's extremely hot. <laughs> it's like it's, you got to kind of work up to that. You get, get kind of get hardy with that. that. That makes us all cry, including me. The sweat lodge is always different. Some, yeah. and it's it's very difficult to know. Well, you can't know what it's going to be like before going in each time. Mm-hmm. And sometimes heat is called for, and sometimes it's just cool, but not your ears don't burn. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's it's really interesting how there is something else. It seems uh, when we're in there that actually is is controlling the heat levels. It's not just. Uh, the so person the running the sweat, no. pouring rock, pouring water, there's some other element. <laughs> well, I really look forward to trying it out. I hope I get the opportunity to come and meet all of you in person. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day. You too.